your life. Yeah. So we are live. So yeah. So um, just waiting for a few people to join. Edit's already joined. Hi guys. Um, my name is AJ, and um, today we're going to be talking about healthy eating and weight management with Elliot John Reed. And we're just waiting for a few more people to join. And before we start the actual segment, hi, do maybe how are you doing? Oh, I need to speak louder. Cool, I'll speak yeah, louder then. Oh, cool, we'll start. Okay, cool. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna invite John Elliot. John, okay, we're just waiting for Elliot. Just waiting for him. What, Elliot? Hey, how you doing? You all right? Good. How you getting on? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. You know, it's so fun. Every time I do this, I'm just a little bit nervous. Just a little bit, a little bit nervous. Because yeah, there's no one, there's no responses. So it's like, it's just like... <laughs> They're just getting warmed up. Yeah. <laughs> you are so right, Sarah? How was your day? Busy. Busy. I've been, um, been back to work for the second week now. So it comes to the end of the second week. And um, I, there were a lot of people in, in pain and a lot of people who needed some advice <laughs> over the over the quarantine period, lockdown period. So I'm dealing with a little bit of a backlog, but okay. at the same time, there's a lot of individuals who uh, are, are, are joining us new, as new customers, getting a uh, bit healthy and pain free. So that's good. Okay, cool. So this is everybody. This is Elliot John Reed. Why don't you just tell us a bit about yourself and your background and what you do? Yes, my name. My name's Elliot Reed. I'm the, the founder and the owner of the Revitalized Health and Fitness Clinic, where we essentially have a, a one-stop shop with a group of fantastic health professionals to get people pain-free, mentally well, and physically fit, and eating well. So we've got our mental health clinic, we've got our pain clinic, where we have osteopaths, physiotherapists, sports therapists, mental health clinic, we have a clinical psychologist, we have a medical herbalist, we have personal trainers, and people who specialize in nutrition as well. But I suppose because it was it was my brainchild, um, yeah. I suppose I've got a, a nice <laughs> overview, a nice view of all the all the services. <laughs> oh nice. So when did you when did you get started in, in personal training? Or well, yeah, so yeah. I, I've always been interested in health. I mean since the age of ten I was reading books on um, health of the body, health of the mind. I think I picked up my first Tony Robbins book, which is more like psychology based when I was 10 years old. And um, since then, I've, I've you know, read a lot about nutrition and, and, and fitness. But it, it happened to be when I was um, 16, yeah. my, um, I hurt my back and I, I, I was boxing at the time. I was due to fight in three days after that. And my mum took me to see an osteopath and the osteopath got me ready for the fight within three days. Oh, so that kind of... See, yeah. uh, my mind, I was like, okay, cool, I can understand because I like knowing how the body works. So that kind of really set the seed in my mind as to how you can use your own skill set to improve someone's fitness or, yeah. sorry, improve, uh, reduce someone's pain. But then I think the real catalyst began when I was 17. And unfortunately, one of my friends passed from leukemia and he was 17. And wow. because he passed so quick, he had an acute leukemia, which meant that he didn't know that he had cancer. He bent down to pick up, he bent down to tie his shoelaces. And um, because his spleen was fighting so hard to protect him or defend him against the cancer, he burst his spleen and he, he bled to death there and then. Um, and I think for me, realizing that we have a very, very limited time on this planet and we're blessed with a very, very limited time on this planet, it inspired me to put together a, a business or a service which enables people to thrive as much as possible with the only vehicle that we've got, right? We've got our body and our mind, and that is the only vehicle that we've got, and it's the only vehicle that we're going to be given. So the best, the better that it runs, the further we can go during our lifetime. And that's, that's essentially what inspired me the most, I think, to do what I do. Wow, that's amazing. That's actually amazing. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, for some people wondering, what, is, what does an osteopath do? What what is it? Yes, yeah, so I think of uh, osteopathy as yeah. more philosophy than anything. And the only the, the easiest way that I can describe it is mm -hmm. that if you imagine um, 
a traditional form of medicine would look at the, the disease and the disease causing the symptom. Whereas osteopathy or more holistic medicine in general would look at the body as an ecosystem. And that ecosystem involves the mind, it involves the physiological processes, it involves the social context of where that person is in, in their life. And um, as well as that, it involves their belief systems, etc. And you work with the ecosystem, let's say, to get them pain free. Now that might mean that I've got someone with back pain. And to get that person pain free, it might mean that I just need to change physiologically what's going on, which means I need to potentially manipulate that joint and give them some strengthening exercises so their back's more tolerant. But if that individual has uh, lost their job because they can't work because their back's painful, then that will upregulate their pain because pain is very, very closely tied into the fear, percept uh, the fear receptors in the brain. So if that individual then has a sense of fear about their back pain because it means they're going to be out of work and they can't provide for their family, if that individual... Um, has a, a diet which is very, very high in inflammatory foods, then yes. it's going to take a lot longer for that individual to get better unless, if they're willing, we can desensitize their back pain by telling them to provide them a strategy. The strategy yes. is kind of actually reduces fear by um, giving them an accurate representation of what's going on. So I'm basically putting them in control, saying that it's going to be okay. You've just twinged this, not catastrophic language. Not saying that you've inflamed this, whacked this out of joint. So you've just twinged it. It's gonna. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put you in control. So I'm gonna treat it. I'm gonna give you exercises. So you're in control of what's going on, um, and then give them a time period within six weeks. You should be back to work. Um, and then also, as well as that, it might be having a look at their diet and saying, in a really nice, easy way, I just need you to cut out these few things and replace them with X, Y, and Z, and you should find that you feel better. The inflammation will reduce. So it's, it's about looking at the whole person, which, to be fair, most good doctors, physiotherapists, chiropractors, dietitians, counsellors, they'll all do that anyway. Um, but osteopathy started 200 years ago. It started with this idea of taking the whole person into consideration. And it's really nice to see that today a lot of fitness and, and medical experts are all coming together on that. That's great. Thank you. And, you know, your last your statement in regards to the mind... Yeah. Make pain grow. Yes. I'm going to ask you a question. You know, just, just something came to mind. So if someone, we're talking about health management and well, weight, man, weight, weight management. If somebody is overweight and they're not happy with the way their, their body is, would that also make them eat more? Do, do you get what I mean? Would that, would that mindset? Kind of. So, yeah. Right. Exactly. So, for example, if that individual has a, uh, a coping mechanism and their coping mechanism for their depression involves them eating because even on a very, very basic physiological level, um, eating mm -hmm. is what we call dopaminogenic or it creates, uh, it releases serotonin and that is a feel-good hormone. So if you feel bad, you're going to eat. But the issue yeah. is that the long-term consequences of you eating makes you feel bad. So you eat. So, <laughs> yeah. so that's, that's the real basic unfortunate cycle that a lot of individuals go through but it has far deeper psychological roots than that yeah okay cool thank you very much we've got joe one second sorry about you. just just as just as chris joined i think he must have thrown a punch or something because just as chris joined it, it, it... <laughs> right. let me just get my uh my charger to this Okay, cool. Everybody, yeah, I think you can see me. That's good. Okay, cool. So the first question is, is it okay to cleanse your body by fasting from time to time? Yeah, I think, I think this is a really interesting question yeah. because and, and it's really interesting because of the word cleanse. Now, yeah. cleanse would uh, actually identify that the food that you're eating is a toxin. So yeah. what, you're, what you're almost assuming is that the food that you're eating is a toxin, therefore you have to cleanse yourself of it, right? Food really should be medicinal. So the foods that you're eating should be actually there to help to heal your body, help to defend you against certain diseases. So what you might find and what research has found is that abstaining from certain foods for a certain period of time 100% does improve health. Um, 
there are some physiological findings, for example, those who go without food for maybe on the 5-2 diet or something like that, that it actually increases their sensitivity to adrenaline, which means that during a training session, they might develop a bit more of a pump. But as also, as well as that, because they're more sensitive to insulin, it means that they will reduce their likelihood of suffering from diabetes. Now, anyone of West African descent, including myself, including you, will be at a higher risk of diabetes, unfortunately. So therefore, even from an ethnocentric perspective, um, 5-2 diet, so sorry, 5-2 diet is basically where you eat for five days uh, normally, and then you go on a, a quite a strong calorie restriction for two days. So Monday to Friday, you eat sensibly, and then Saturday and Sunday, you um, you cut these, you, you cut your, your calorie intake quite low. So from a very, very reductionist perspective, Yes, there are some minor physiological benefits to fasting, but the greatest um, benefit when it comes to fasting is the behavioral, behavioral changes that result. So, for example, AJ, if, I, if you had, um, say, you're up for, uh, you sleep for eight hours, so you're awake for 16 hours. If I give you 16 hours to eat, you will most likely eat more than if I was to give you 10 hours to eat. Yeah, so you, you naturally find yourself attaining a calorie restriction on, for example, intermittent fasting or a 5-2 diet because that individual is just eating less. If they eat less, then it means that they're going to be less likely to be obese or to have a diet-inducing obesity, which yeah. means their inflammation levels will reduce, their insulin, insulin sensitivity will, will increase, which means they're less likely to suffer from diabetes, joint pain, heart disease, stroke, cancer, all these nasty things which are associated with obesity also go down. So I'd say that it's important with intermittent fasting to focus on the behavioural changes that take place, which is the biggest factor for most people. And then also on a small level, you'll get certain physiological benefits as well. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. So the next one is I'm trying to lose weight. Actually, before I say the next question, if you have any questions, there's a question box. Please put in the question box or in the comments as well. So we'll be answering the questions as we go. Um, so the second question is, I'm trying to lose weight, but what is the healthiest way without eating rabbit food? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So key thing, the healthiest, healthiest way, right, um, to lose weight. Healthiest way to lose weight is, first of all, let's start with the psycho psychology side of it, is a way that you can sustain. So a diet that you can keep up with long term. A diet that is free from shame. So it's not good to shame yourself when you eat or shame yourself when you don't eat. So you need to make sure that psychologically you can keep up with it, right? Now, secondly, um, what we generally find is that when fiber increases and when whole food intake increases, calorie intake tends to reduce. So that would mean keeping to good, healthy whole foods. When it comes to keeping away from rabbit food, I would yeah. very, very much suggest that you learn how to cook. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, because when you take into consideration the vast array of plants and whole foods that are available to eat, yeah. the, the, the diversity or the variation of delicious recipes that you can cook and eat well is just vast, right? It's just absolutely massive. Um, so I would say making sure that you're keeping up with a diet that you can keep up with psychologically, a diet that includes whole foods um, and a lot of plants, and as well as that, a lot of protein. Now, if you um, are, so I'm, I'm plant-based, I don't eat meat or fish, so my protein will come from legumes and, and kidney beans and lentils and things like that. Um, but for someone who eats meat, you might want to more rely on uh, leaner cuts, so like fish or leaner cuts of beef or, or chicken. Um, and I'd say that's key, but you know, if, if, if you wanted to be really held accountable, then I would suggest that you take all of the advice that I've just mentioned into consideration and download an app called my fitness pal, because it's really easy to put in all of your calorie intake. Um, it will give you basically a budget for the day. So a budget of calories that you can consume and, uh, you can essentially just use that almost as a bank balance of calories that you can use throughout the day and know that by the end of the week, you should have lost weight. And if you haven't lost weight, then it means the calories are probably too high. The last, sorry, the last tip is that right. you, need, 
you need to make sure you strength train. Um, individuals who do not strength train whilst dieting are likely to lose up to 40%. Yeah, my fitness pal. They're likely to use, lose up to 40% of their weight from their muscle tissue. Not good. Muscle tissue is essential for our health. It's essential for our ability to burn calories. It, it shapes us. It makes us look good. It, get, it makes us look good in our clothes. So you don't want to be losing your muscle mass as well. Well, thank you very much. Um, again, if you have any more questions, um, just put it in the question box. And I will be taking those questions shortly. So the next one is, and again, to the diet, does the keto diet help to lose or gain weight? Again, yeah. I'll say that. Does the keto diet help to lose or gain weight? Yeah, so the keto diet, so a really good book to read on the keto diet would be, um, I think it's Guide to Ketogenic Dieting or something like that, by or The Ultimate Diet by uh, Lyle McDonald. If you just type in Lyle McDonald, um, keto diet, he's a really good source of information on this. It's a really, really informative book. So the, the, the ketogenic diet is basically where you really cut down your consumption of carbohydrates um, and fats to make sure that you're shifting more of your calorie intake to come from protein. Now, yeah. the body then has to convert the protein to ketones, um, and there's certain evidence to show that individuals who are already at a low body fat percentage, so you're looking at about 13% body fat or lower, do lose weight quicker on a ketogenic diet. I've used a ketogenic diet before to cut weight for a powerlifting, um, powerlifting competition or a deadlifting competition, and it worked really well. Uh, but it's not, uh, in terms of lifestyle, it's not the easiest to keep up with, right? Yeah. Because you're the, 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 to eat that much protein, it'll make your breath stink. Uh, the, 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 the toilet, the toilet habits are too good. So, because <laughs> you know, the more protein you use, even just simple protein shakes, your toilet, you'll be going to the toilet more often because you need to get, yeah, you need to cleanse. It's just not nice. So, <laughs> so the, the other thing with uh, the keto diet is that it's the behavioral changes that take place that cause people to lose most of their weight. So, for example, if I said to someone who's already, because when I talk about 13% body fat, you're already seeing abs, right? At 13% body, you're already lean. You're already in a re re really good shape. It's just to take, it's just to accelerate the progress beyond that. Um, now, the, the thing is, is that if I was to take someone who was 25, 30% body fat and put them on a keto diet, they're going to lose weight because they can't eat that much. If I was yeah. to ask them to eat 2,500 calories of chicken breast, it, you, it, it would just, it would drive you crazy. Like you're just not going to, you're not going to eat that much. So it's the, it's the behavioral changes that take place. The benefit of the ketogenic diet as well is because the protein intake is so high, you're more likely to spare muscle tissue. So you're less likely to lose as much muscle tissue. Yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. So, um, someone asked the question, what is weight training? But this next question should answer that. What type of training do I need to do to increase muscle mass and lose weight? Sorry, say that again. What type of training do I need to do to increase muscle so, mass and lose weight? What training do I need to do to increase muscle mass and lose weight at the same yeah. time? Yeah, yeah, no problem. So, this is far easier for novices to do than more advanced uh, athletes or lifters because advanced lifters are already working within um, a, a much smaller range of possible adaptation. Whereas because you're, if you're a novice, so it means you haven't really trained that much before, it means that you haven't even utilized your range of adaptation. So in terms of losing fat and putting on muscle, easy for beginners. The best way to do it is to strength train, making sure that you're training at least at a seven to eight out of 10 level of intensity. So you're actually pushing your body to adapt. Um, I would make sure that you're covering a, uh, a range of rep ranges, ranging from say five reps to 10 to 12 reps. So you might have, for example, a heavy push for five reps, three sets, and you might have assistance for you know another few exercises that still push. Still working the push muscles, but like 10, 12 reps. Um, now, when it comes to your diet, you just need to be on a calorie deficit. So once again, you can use my fitness power and just make sure that the calorie deficit isn't too much. Because if the calorie deficit is too much, then your body goes into a stress response. When your body goes through a stress response, it puts off long-term projects. Long-term projects would be things like building muscle because it takes time to get there. So you need to make sure that your calorie restriction isn't too much, probably about 500 
calories a day. Yet strength training can be lifting weights. It can be calisthenics. Anything where you're moving your body against resistance would be strength training. So to summarize, I, I would say making sure that you're eating a healthy diet, at a good calorie restriction, and making sure that you're getting stronger at the same time. Much easier to do for beginners than advanced lifters. One of the one of the things that um, I try to get into people's minds when they're training is how are you checking your improvement? Because one thing I notice to people that make people give up is that they have no way of checking their improvement. And I would say if you can't track something, you're not going to improve in it. So what, what is the best way for people to check their improvement, not just stepping on the scale? What what else do you should you be focusing on? Yeah, so I would say that, and this is very dependent on the individual, but I would put it down to whatever their emotions are tied to hardest. If their emotions are tied to their appearance, then get them to take before and after pictures. If yeah. their emotions are tied to numerics, then uh, get them to then take their body fat percentage or uh, get them to step on a scale. If they're um, emotionally tied to strength, to strength or speed, then measure that. And I would probably prioritize hierarchically whatever they're most emotionally attached to and then start to scale down from there. I mean, it might be for an individual that they're really focused on. I'm just going to tell them the light story. It might be that for an individual, they're really focused on getting their body fat percentage down. And yeah. um, if they're really focused on getting their body fat percentage down, um, then measure that. But it could also be that an individual is really, sorry, focused on getting their cholesterol levels down. So that is also a pretty good thing to measure, or even their blood pressure. Okay, cool. So what you're saying essentially is that it's not just numbers. It's more your emotion. What what led you to start the training in the first place? Yeah, of course, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Because, but my my philosophy or my meaning behind training might be completely different to yours. Because yeah. I know that you're um, you come from obviously you, you you do weight training, but you come from a football background as well, right? American football. Yeah, is yeah, that right? yeah, yeah, is that, yeah. Right. So, if you versus a boxer or you versus me, might have completely different emotional ties to your outcome. You might, your agility or top speed might be absolutely top for you. Whereas a boxer might be, um, how many hard punches can he throw before he gets tired? So if there's, there's different outcomes dependent on the individual. Some, some uh, clients want to look really good in a dress. Other clients want to live as long as possible. So it's completely dependent on the individual. Okay, cool. So we've got some questions here in the question box. I'm just going just gonna yes. to... Um, so the first one I would say is that what type of intermittent fasting would you advise for females? Advice for females? Right. Let's try and make this specific to females. Mm, yeah. If we can. I'm trying to think of how female physiology might intertwine with fasting mm, I don't think that there will be that much that much of a significant difference between men and women apart from their time of the month so they might find that their cravings really increase at certain times of the month and then also as well as that they might find that they start, start to crave certain foods purely because of the iron content of that food Okay. So I would say that it's probably better to cycle your nutrition than your fasting. At certain times, so when you start to menstruate, I would then start to look at higher intake of unsaturated fats, so oils, polysaturated fats, seeds, nuts, and then also as well as that dark leafy greens, so um, things like cabbage, spinach for their iron content, um, so yeah, I don't think, I, I, I would say that focus on the period of fasting that works best for you emotionally. The other really good thing about fasting is that it trains you to cope with hunger, which I think is a really good thing because no one, no one dies of, no one dies or does themselves harm from the sensation of hunger. Obviously yeah. starvation, yeah, but hunger is just a sensation. It's something to get used to. Um, it's something to be able to tolerate. So I would say pick the period of fasting that you can tolerate and um, cycle your nutrition when needed. Awesome, awesome. So the next one, oh, sorry, I just moved the camera. So the next one here is, what type of training do I need to do to lose weight without gaining muscle? So I'm guessing this is a female that's asking like, 
what what is because uh, the question I get a lot of people when I'm training is like I don't want to look like a guy. Do you know what I mean? So well, how can they? <laughs> I, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> I wish it was that easy. And that's why I say today I wish it was that you know just like yeah. make, it, make it like just go in there and I just walk out and I just like, I gain muscles. So it's just like that, yeah. Two weeks, two weeks. <laughs> um, I would say that probably, as, as you'd say, AJ, that they probably have a, a bit of a, a misconception yeah. of what muscle looks like when you put it on, um, what muscle um, does when you put it on. Because the most likely finding for, for women who put on muscle is that their clothes fit better, they feel stronger, more powerful. They, they, their posture is better. Uh, their stomach is flatter. Their legs are better shaped. So that is one thing I think needs to be stressed to that individual who asked that question. But if you didn't want to put on muscle, then I would say still strength train. So you're not losing muscle, but just really reduce your intensity to like a five, to like a four or five out of ten. Okay, awesome. Let's just go. Um, I think Tori asked, also, what times, what type is, what, what's the type, oh, I can't, also, with the types is time-restricted fasting good, sometimes not to lose weight, but to stay fit. So I'm guessing what they're asking is that, can you use fasting to stay in better shape? Does it work in that sense? Um, only because, for most people, only because of the calorie deficit. So when you get to a low enough body fat percentage, so like 13% or lower, so definitely seeing abs, that's when it starts to become quite effective because the individual will be increasing their insulin sensitivity, which means that their body won't secrete as much insulin, which means that they're less likely to put on fat. Yeah. Um, but, um, sorry, what was the question again? So, so. Yeah. so what types of intermittent fasting is good for you to stay in shape, not oh. necessarily lose weight? Oh, okay. Doesn't matter then. It doesn't matter yeah. because the whole concept of intermittent fasting is a very small physiological benefit and the ease of losing weight. That's yeah. So if you don't want to lose weight, then don't intermittently fast. The only <laughs> the, the one thing that I find, one thing that I find is that when I fast in the morning, yeah. because like I said, there's a bit of a there's a bit of a theory or some data to show that we're more sensitive to adrenaline. That I tend to have a little bit of a hungry buzz about me. So I tend to be more productive when I'm hungry, um, which I find translates into my work, but not necessarily my fitness. Yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah, because when I fast, I'm more focused, I find, because I, I, yeah, I'm not thinking about, yeah. So 100%. I observe the work I need to do on yes. the day I fast, because I just know I'm just more mentally sharp right. at that point. And there's a reason for that. There's, um, I think it was uh, Dr. Matthew Walker. I, don't, I, don't, I, that, I think that's his name, but he wrote a book called uh, Why We Sleep. And uh, the reason why is that when we're hungry or when we're on a, a calorie deficit, even if it's for that period of time, you, you want to search for food. And that's why, for example, hunter-gatherers in their, in their natural environment sleep significantly less than um, say individuals who live in more civilized environments. And it's because their, their phys physiology is driving them to get up early and search for food because they're constantly on this calorie excess, deficit, calorie maintenance. So that's probably why we feel this type of buzz where we're like, you, you almost like you've got, you, either, you, you, we will say that I've got to work, I've got to do something, but on a deeper physiological basis, that will be, I have to find food, I have to get it. And it's, that's why I think we get that focus. I'm totally with you, yeah. So someone question is that, how quickly do you start to see changes when doing different types of training? So way to make sense is that how quickly, if you're doing the, if you're training and you're following a plan and you're, you're, you're using the, the, what you said about the intensity seven to eight, how mm. quickly do someone start to see differences? Yes, there's a fantastic book uh, called The Sports Gene by David Epstein. And what, he, what he's found through his data analysis, right, is that there is a, such an amazing variation in how human beings respond to training. You've got yeah. individuals that you might say are top ramped, which means that they come into their novices, but as a novice, they're super strong and super quick. But with training, they make minimal gains, almost like they, they're already maxed out. 
at their um, at their natural level, right? You've got some individuals who are very fast gainers. So they they there was a, an example of an individual who, when he's not training, he loses his fitness quick. He finds it difficult to walk up a flight of stairs. But within weeks of training or months of training, he's ready for the world stage. Yeah. So there's there's a huge variance um, in how people adjust to training. For example, there's um there's literal scouts in America who will scout for potential. They don't scout for the finished product. They scout for potential. And there was an individual who I think went to college. So he was like 18. And within a year, he was competing uh, on a national level for high jump. And when they assessed his body, they found out that his calves were massively uh, much bigger than the average person. And his Achilles tendon was like, so his, his calf tendon was like yeah. two or three times thicker than the average individual, which means that when he hit the floor, it literally acted like a spring and just flung him over the, the high jump. So there's, there's unfortunately, there's a massive uh, variation of how individuals adapt to training. And the beauty of it is you only yeah. know when you try it. So you should try it. <laughs> That's the thing. Joseph, I was having a conversation with someone today and I was like, with people, we tend to focus on the things we don't have. So it's like, oh, I don't have you know the arms. I don't have the bum. I don't have the, the abs. I'm like, but you have the shoulders. You have, you know, it's like it works differently for everybody. And it just I'm like I'm, I'm looking, like, at, like I'm looking at your beard. Yours is not too bad. You got to do your beard. <laughs> so yeah, moving on. It's like, is working out in the morning better for you? than any other time? Oh, once again, I'd play this 100% down to the individual. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that people's circadian rhythms so are, are quite different. And that is, so in that book again, uh, Why We Sleep, he yeah. covers how there are some individuals who just find getting up in the morning really hard. And the reason why is because genetically or environmentally, they just have not been rigged that way. So if, for example, for me, I'm an early bird. So I love getting up at like five o'clock and just busting out the training session. And it really sets me up for my day. Now, for some individuals, their circadian rhythm might be three hours delayed. So for them to get up at, or three hours in front. So for them to get up at five is the equivalent of them actually getting up at two o'clock in the morning. And I wouldn't be able to train at two o'clock in the morning, no matter how much I tried. So I think it is very, very important for an individual to be honest with themselves, assess historically when are they most productive and make sure that when it comes to their, their day job or their passion, that they do the most productive work when they're the most alert. And when it comes to their training, try and get the best training session in when they're most alert. Okay, cool. So next question is, um, which one is, how do I lose belly fat? So I th I, this must be a question you get a lot of. So just yeah. spend some time just going through the process because, you know, this is a question a lot of men and women ask themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. What is the process? Yeah. So first of all, belly fat is a very, very important thing to acknowledge because belly fat has one of the closest correlations between um, body findings or body measurements and diabetes and uh, cholesterol and heart disease, which would also link to strokes and things like that, right? So belly fat is very important. Um, now, the fact is, unfortunately, you can't spot reduce, but what you can do is um, create... So what I mean by spot reduce is it, you can't choose or you can't dictate where you lose body fat from, unfortunately. And... Yeah. So what that means is that we have no choice but to try and lean out or, or, or lean ourselves up and uh, lean ourselves down. And we have to accept that we're going to lose fat from wherever we lose fat from. But what you can do is create, I suppose, an illusion of having a tighter trimmer waist. And that will come from an exercise called a vacuum, which is really good. So a vacuum is where you tense uh, a muscle called the transverse abdominis. It was yeah. popularized by Arnold Schwarzenegger, who despised, despite being six foot four, had something like a 28 inch waist or something like that. 
Now, all you do is you suck your belly in as hard as you can and make sure that you can talk and breathe at the same time. And you hold that position for maybe like five sets of 40 seconds. That will create a vacuum or a vacuum like look to flatten your belly. The other thing is to 100% train your abs. Now, train, training your abs in isolation is absolutely great. There's no problem with that. But also remember that strength training, because you're having to stabilize your core, uh, you're automatically going to be using your abs anyway. I've had clients who have lost, like, I'm not even joking, like six inches off their waist in a month just because their core has become a lot tighter. Yes, their body fat percentage is shot down, but their core has become a lot tighter as well. So I would focus on a calorie deficit, making sure your protein is high, making sure that your strength training, whole body compound movements, which means big movements, so big push and pull movements, and uh, ab conditioning. Is there any links online to the exercise you mentioned about from Arnie um, for people to look? Or is it just literally sucking your belly in for 40 seconds? At but, um, I don't, I'm trying to think now if I've done a video on it. I haven't. Um, so, therefore... If you type in vacuum exercise on YouTube, you'll get loads of examples. But try not to overcomplicate it. There'll be people trying to kind of sell it off as the next best thing, but it's just a standard exercise. You don't have to make it too complicated. So <laughs> in terms of complication is that someone wrote here, should I approach my sessions with a plan? So what, So because you, you, you get, you do get people that just walk into a gym and just, you know, just like, as the wind blows me, with, yeah, this is cool. <laughs> this is, yeah. So... <laughs> What, what is the pros and cons of having a plan? Yeah. Okay. I would say the main uh, cons yeah. that I found with plans is one, individuals who suffer with mental health. And the time, and this is because when people are mentally fragile, holding themselves accountable to do anything when everything is hard is yeah. really, really difficult to do. It is much better for that individual to face, to view exercise as expression, in my opinion. So you're, at first, you're just going to go out there and express yourself. When you're running, you're going to just try and glide. When you're boxing, you're going to hit something. When you're lifting weight, you're just going to shift something hard and fast, right? It's much better, I think. Um, the other time where the plan is, 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 is a con is when the plan's bad. And the plan, <laughs> a bad plan would be, something that pushes an individual too hard. Uh, it is much better to push someone consistently at a seven to eight out of 10 level of intensity than push them at a 10 out of 10 level of intensity for three weeks, injure them or turn them off of it. And then they don't come back to the gym for five weeks after that. The, the pros of a, of a good program is that it first of all plans stress response. So training is a form of stress, but it's a stress that we want to adapt to. Now, a good program will take into consideration every maybe four to six weeks, a deload period, which is where that program will just drop off a little bit and focus on something else or focus on the same thing at a lesser intensity. Make sure that individual is less likely to burn themselves out. They're less likely to hurt themselves at, as, at, the, at the main focus. But also... The benefit, and the last point, the benefit of a program is it offers that individual predictable wins. And if an individual can turn up to the gym and be confident that they're going to achieve something and achieve that, it's fantastic for setting momentum. And it's also brilliant for um, developing a very positive relationship with exercise. Oh, that's good. And the one thing I always say to people, because I follow plans, and the thing is that at the end of it, if it says take a week to start a new one, and my body say no, I'm listening to my body. Do you know, like, and I think that's the most important thing. You have to listen to your body because the plan is just based on generalization of people. But you, like you've mentioned earlier, every single person is different. So if it takes two weeks to recover and start again, take your two weeks without feeling ashamed or that you failed or anything. And I think that's, that's sometimes the problem people find with plans because their bodies are different. It adapts differently. 100%, so, man. I completely yeah. agree. 100%. So the next question. So, guys... Um, you know, please, you know, Elias, as you probably noticed, just a word of knowledge. Um, oh, post your, question, <laughs> post your questions um, in the question box. So the next question is, um, how long do I need to work out for? What do you mean? Um, to get results? Um, to get results. And if you, if I'm going to a gym, because again, this is a question people ask, like when people go to a gym, 
is that should I go for like 30 minutes, one hour? Like, what is the, what is in your, in your opinion, how long someone should work out for that will get them results? Yeah, it, once, it depends on how uh, novice that individual is. So if they're a novice, they haven't been to the gym before, they could work out for 30 minutes and get really, really good results. But then they might get to a point where their progress, i.e. their ability to gain strength or speed or power, like whatever they're mentioning, or whatever they're focusing on, starts to actually reduce. Now, when, or, or starts to plateau. Now, if they start to plateau, it means that the limiting factor for their progression, so the one thing that's holding them back, might be their training volume, i.e. they need to lift more, more often, or for longer, to get the necessary results for the next step. So... I think that, you know, when people say that, a lot of the time they're coming from um, more of a novice perspective where they don't, they, almost like the idea of going to a gym for 90 minutes, five days a week, is just harrowing. Like, they just don't want to do it. So, so I would say go to the gym for 30 minutes, be in and out within 30 minutes, focus on your strength, uh, focus on getting the volume in. So you might, might be that rather than take two minutes rest in between each set, you take a minute rest, it might be that you do circuits instead so you can just whip it out all in one yeah. and go for that instead. But the, the, the focus is uh, to make sure that you'll get into the gym in the first place. Okay. So the question is, what difference would a personal trainer make, in your opinion? A lot. Okay. Like, a lot. <laughs> for, for a novice or someone that knows what they're doing, or is it the same? Uh, both. Both. I think... Um, you know, like, I've had personal trainers uh, when I was, I mean, when thinking of it, I, yes, I had a personal trainer when I did my deadlift competition. And yeah, I did like, considering I already deadlifted, I don't know, I was already deadlifting like 195, 200 yeah. kilos. And within like a couple months, I got up to 260 kilos, at like 80, 81 kilos in body weight. And that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the, the trainer and his expertise. But then I come from a boxing background and there's no way that I was going to become a good boxer without a coach. And I think that's the same thing in life, right? If you want to get good at anything, you can find an expert who's also good at that and has been there and done that and, uh, and can help you. I, even at this stage, 100%, I would benefit from a personal trainer. Like if I was training with someone once a week, 100%, it would benefit me. Same as a trainer. But then you could get the same thing from a training partner as well. To, like even today I had a few sprints to do and I had to just drag one of my friends to come with me because I just know if you don't have someone the moment that pain hits you're just going to go home you're just, you're just going to be like yeah and I think sometimes as, as, it's just being honest with yourself and just saying am I likely to bail out when it gets hard yet yeah. am I more <laughs> likely to keep up with it if there's someone there yet yeah. <laughs> okay let's get that person on board then and one thing I'll say, the trick is to find someone that doesn't like you that much. You know, someone that's going to be like, I kind of want to see you. Because <laughs> you know, if I take someone that, you know, like my mom or something, she's going to be like, stop, just stop. Just, 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 just stop. Wait. Uh, yeah. yeah. I try to find someone that really doesn't like me that much. So like, as soon as I'm running, she's like, get faster, just get faster. <laughs> 100%. <Is> that, when, <laughs> I remember when we were at the... So I was I was boxing at the Lynn in uh, South London, and um, have you seen uh, Isaac Chamberlain? So Isaac Chamberlain's um, I I don't know if he's I think I don't think he, I don't know if he's a title holder at the moment, but he's I think he's from Hackney, and he's a cruiserweight now. And uh, I remember my first few spars with him at the Lynn, and he was so vicious, like he really wanted to like tear your face off with his punches oh, and it it brought the best out of me so I can't I can't argue but <laughs> it's the same thing like you said when someone wants to uh, when someone wants up the ante it's yeah. a good motivator for you to do the same thing as well so don't run away from the people that want to up the ante that, that's the idea just don't don't do that 100% and it's even like you know the early psychologists will say that a lot of the time what you seek is in the darkest places and what you seek is in the toughest spots. So don't shy away from it. Go there. You know, even if you're looking at um, scripture, is it Jesus when he confronted the confronted Satan in the desert? Luke's the devil in the desert. 
you got you got to face you got to face the darkness and and prove your worth kind of thing. All right, cool, awesome. So next question is, do I need to vary my workouts to see results? No, not not too much, um, because you it would almost be like you wanting to get good at maths and then saying right, I'm going to do maths for like a couple of days and I'm going to pick up chemistry, then I'm going to pick up English. Yeah. You, you might become better at learning, but you're not necessarily going to become better at maths, and uh, yeah. you want to make sure. Because like I said, you know, training is all about a stress response and you want to make sure that the stress is high enough to facilitate a result. And if you're constantly changing your workouts, it means that you're not getting a consistent level of stress. Um, so, you know, I, I would say vary your workouts, like you've mentioned, when you need a rest. Yeah. Vary your workouts if you find you've got a fairly short attention span or if you're not too focused on the numerical outcome of your training. But apart from that, you don't need to vary your workouts too much. Okay, lovely, lovely. Um, guys, please feel free to put your questions in the question box. You know, there's no silly questions. Just, just ask away any question you want to ask. So a question here is that, um, what is the best way to help sore muscles? Help sore muscles? Yeah. Right. So one thing would be um, any foods that contain antioxidants. So antioxidants are foods that basically defend your cell's ability to maintain uh, an optimum metabolism or optimum yeah. process, right? So antioxidants are found in a lot of deep red fruits and veg. So beetroot, cherries, cabbage, I think as well. Um, dark greens also have a lot of antioxidants in, especially when you get in your spinach, your kale, uh, kiwis, things like that. And uh, the other is to stay away from um, foods which cause an increased uh, amount of inflammation. So that an increased amount of inflammation could come from uh, trans fat. So that's food. That's when you find. That's what you find in a lot of processed foods. Um, also, foods that are high in saturated fat or animal proteins also have um, uh, an inflammatory cause. Dairy is massively inflammatory. Dairy is, is, is very, very inflammatory. So staying away from dairy can help as well. And making sure that your protein intake is high. So um, the protein intake being high will just make sure that you um, you build, you rebuild your, your muscle tissue and your cell structure um, quicker after a training session. And the last one would be vitamin C. Vitamin C is a catalyst for um, tissue repair. So vitamin C is found in a lot of citrus fruits. Uh, but most fruit and veg has, yeah, say no to dairy, exactly, Sarah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so yes, yeah, vitamin C as well. Okay, so this is, this is a question, but I'm going to try to do it in stages. So one of the things that I do to stay in shape, for example, I'll set myself a task. Like now, next year, I'm doing a marathon. And what? Well yeah, done. Nice, it's, man. It's, Wicked. I'm to run for it's, it's just not that. But I think the reason I do it and the reason I set myself up is that mentally for me, it puts me where I have to. Do you know I mean? So I have to, you know, I almost put like a chip on my shoulder to say that you, you, you have to get yourself out there and start training for this. Otherwise you're just going to embarrass yourself. You're braver, you're braver than me. <laughs> you're braver than me. <laughs> but that credit to you, yeah. Thank you. So what, do you, what are the ways to get you moving? If you're someone that wants to lose weight, wants to get in better shape, wants to do same things, thank you, lady. What is the way to get you actually off, you know, out of the house or working out in your house? What can you suggest the ways to get people moving in that direction? I would say sit down with a pen and paper yeah. and write down not just at the moment, but historically. So during your childhood, during your early adulthood, whatever, all of the things that you like doing that involve movement. It might yeah. be walking, it might be running, it might be hitting boxing, it might be lifting things up might be climbing it could be dancing anything write it down and then think right what is what can i actually do right now which fits these criteria and it might be that you join a dance class it might be that you join a boxing club it could be that you uh, join a boxing gym or the local gym you join a class like i think that for probably what's what's happened especially you know in, in this part of the, I don't know, 21st century, um, we've only associated exercise with gyms and it's just not the case. Uh, as, long as, you're, as long as you're moving and as long as you're having fun, that is the only thing that matters. And don't try and let, I don't know, Instagram or your friends persuade you that if you don't go to the gym, 
and pump weights that you're not exercising. Like humans have been in existence for 200,000 years and gyms have only been around recently. So it's, you don't, you don't need that for health or strength. Yeah. And th this is um, something that I try to tell people. It's like, you know, don't try to box your, 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 your health in, in a room. Do you know what I mean? Don't try to say if the gym is closed, I'm not going to go anywhere. I've seen guys going to a gym and because the deadlift is not open or this is not open, they've literally just stood there, for hours, you know, just caged in this kind of mindset that if I don't follow this plan, the way it's structured or something, I can't do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I'm like, just do, find a variation, do something different. That's the whole, that's the fun aspect of workout, Jeremy, is to find different ways in your like, body. Like when I, when you were training at, when I used to see you training at Bulks, like the yeah. fun stuff you'd come up with, with the jumps and the, the box jumps and then you try and get a bit more creative with it and try this and that. And you, you basically just turned into play, right? You're just playing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's the beauty of it. And I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's the same thing. Um, I mean, like, uh, um, one second. Yeah, like Bobby has just joined and Bobby was a gymnast, crossfitter and weightlifter oh, wow. and the British champion as well. And I doubt, I'm, I'm sure that she had some uh, parts some bits in time where she found it quite difficult, but it was, it would have all been fun. A lot of it would have been fun in total. If it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like playing. If it doesn't feel like playing, then you need to maybe even get used to it or find something else. <laughs> this is the, there's so many different types of ways to stay in shape. You know, I've always said to people, you know, if you enjoy netball in school, like you said, with a pen and paper, join a netball team, netball team. Join yeah. something that's going to make you move. Absolutely, man. It's all like it's it's all it's, it's all fun and games. Like it's all, and I, I think that's sometimes a bit of conflict that people generate within themselves because they all see other people having fun in, in in an environment that they're not having fun, and then they'll assume not that the gym's not for me or not that dance isn't for me. That's like exercise isn't for me. Yeah. Um, but they haven't tried enough yet. They don't. They don't know. Okay. One of the, one of the questions. One of the few last questions is: How does exercise help your mental state? Your mental health, mental health and mental state, I guess, yeah. Yeah, so on a, on a very basic, um, so this is what, I suppose, the, the way to look at it, right? We as human beings have innate beneficial relationships with our historical surroundings. So, yeah. for example, historically, we would have had to move a lot and what would have been the easiest food to eat would have been fruit, veg and root vegetables. So therefore, we have a very, very beneficial relationship with moving and fruit and veg, right? And the same thing goes for mental health and our environment. For example, a study found that runners tend to suffer from depression 40% less than the average population. Um, now, this is partly because exercise taps into our endorphins, which are our feel-good hormones. So we get a release of dopamine from the achievement. We might get a release of oxytocin, which is another feel-good hormone from being around people that we like and that we care about. Um, but as well as that, from a perspective of mindfulness, it takes our mind off of the things that uh, might be troubling us throughout the day. So that's another thing. And then as well as that, it grounds us. So a lot of things that people have difficulty with when they're suffering from poor mental health is they don't feel grounded in their environment. Now, if this gets bad enough, it can go into what's called, um, you know, you might find that someone is developing psychosis, which is where their perception of reality is distorted, or it might be that they're suffering from disassociation, which is where they feel like the world that they're in isn't actually here, like it's an illusion. But with exercise, because you're moving yourself in space, because you're lifting things up, you're picking it down, it is also a form of grounding yourself in your environment. So you're yeah. acting on your environment, and that is also really good for people's mental health. Okay. So as we're slowly going to rounding up now, so one, the next question is, what is your reason for working out, and why should, why should people work out? Yeah, I think I've probably developed... Because I, I was boxing from the age of, say, uh, 12, um, I've developed such a routine around exercise. And I was getting up and running at 6 o'clock in the morning, 
I was training for three, four hours in the evening. So I know that my body relies on it because I've relied on it since I was 13. And when I, when I don't do it, my body feels soft. I don't feel good in myself. Yeah. Um, my, I feel like I get out of breath easier. I feel vulnerable. So when I'm out and about and if I feel like I could potentially be in danger, I don't feel as capable of myself as, as defending myself, as well as that it gives me a copious amount of more energy throughout the day. So it means that I'm more productive. So there's many reasons um, why, I, why I exercise. Yeah, many reasons. And I think that meaning is very subjective to the individual. And I think that people just need to find their meaning when it comes to exercise, why they do it. One, one of the things that, you know, I'm going to try to tell people and, you know, I've learned from you today is that associate your exercise, your emotional self. So what makes you, what makes you either, what makes you want to exercise or what you're unhappy with, then remember that when the going gets tough almost, do you know what I mean? Like remember that as when you're doing this and that's something that everyone can take away from today. 100%. And that's, yeah. that's, that's, your, that's, your, that's where your meaning becomes more important. And um, Lauren, Lauren just said, how do you tell the difference between feeling tired because your body needs to rest or feeling tired because you've worked hard? Oh, okay. So Lauren, I'll focus on your performance. So if you notice that you're, you can't set up your form, if you notice that you're not as strong, if you notice that you're not as quick, for example, then it indicates that's objective. That's objective reduction in performance. That means that you need to take a break. If it's that you just don't feel up for it, but you get into the gym and you feel fine, then it's most likely that it was just a subjective period of subjective blip. You haven't got to worry about it. Another way I'd say to Lauren is that one thing I try to do is track my progress. And this is why it's so important to me. Like I track things like when I run a 5K, am I improving? Like, you know, what are the splits? What is, you know, because I think a lot of people, if you're not tracking your progress, then you're not, you're not going to know if you're actually improving or not improving. And that's one thing that's, that's very important. Absolutely. So yeah, thank you so much for coming on today. And, um, you know, we've really learned so much from you. And I think one thing I'm taking away is that it, you, you have to study these things. It's not enough to just, you know, read a line here or there, but, you know, you really just study how your body works and what ways you can actually stay healthy. That's the, that's the most important thing. That's Good, more, one more thing is that how are you, you know, as, as, as a black man, able to stay away from meat? Because I know you're vegan, so it's like, you know, how, how are you? Because everywhere you go, there must be meat around you everywhere, chicken, everything. Like, how, how are you able to do it? So, this is, this is, this is interesting because um, your roots are, is it Nigerian? Yeah, I'm Nigerian, yeah, Nigerian, yeah. So, I think, I mean, there are a lot of parallels between, say, the Jamaican diet, so my family, Jamaican, Nigerian diet, but what you tend to notice is that as uh, people in Jamaica, for example, I think the same in West Africa as well, are more upwardly mobile. So when, you, when individuals uh, start to get more money, they start to eat. But when you start to look at the countryside or the, the people who live in country, they will be eating far more fruit and vegetable-based foods. And then when you look at the rusters in Jamaica, they're all, they eat ayatel, so they're all vegan, plant-based. So, and in, in Jamaican cuisine, you know, apart from when you're looking at, you know, like jerk or, or, or even when you look at oxtail, a lot of the time, or, 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 or pigtail um, or chicken foot, like a lot of the time, the meat is just there for flavor. Just a little bit of flavor, rundown. Rundown is, is like a, where you, you might cook salt fish in a pan with um, some coconut milk and loads of herbs and, and vegetables. But it's, the, the fish is just there for a little bit of flavor. And okay. um, I, find, I find it really easy. I, I honestly, I swear to God that the Caribbean diet for, um, for vegans is amazing. But I have to say, moe moe and effa and happy <laughs> jam are wicked. <laughs> I can't lie, they are, they are. They are. <laughs> but on that note, Elliot, thank you so much again. Really appreciate you coming on. And I'm sure we have you on again to try and educate okay. us. Thank you so Anytime. much. Um, just be, you know, as Elliot is there, you know, we are the Connect Church. We meet every Tuesday. And, you know, we are a church that, you know, we, we just we talk about God and we share, you know, things about God with people. So hopefully we'll see you on Tuesday. We've got some events going on tomorrow and Sunday. So hopefully we'll see you there. But again, thank you, Elliot. Thank you for joining us. Thank and we'll you see you again shortly. Thank you, mate. All right, thank you. Thank you, man. All the best.
Okay. Awesome.